In a broken and chaotic world, there is one truth that remains. The truth that love is stronger. As the world begins to re-emerge after two years of confusion, in whatever state you may find yourself in, please join us at East Coast International Church to discover and embrace this love. Happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter. Great to have you with us today. Those of you joining us online in Revere, hello from uh, Lynn today. I want to say thank you. It's been an um, exciting weekend, Good Friday service, uh, our, our time of meditation. And yesterday we had our giant Easter egg hunt that was great down at Eastland Little League. Thank you for all of those who volunteered and filled eggs. There was some good stuff in there. I might have taken a couple. The, uh, so it was, it was good. Um, and for those of you that are uh, relatively new with us here at East Coast International Church, maybe you started coming during the pandemic or in the last few months, and you haven't been to one of our start lunches, we have a start lunch next Sunday right after church, right after the second service here in Lynn, and uh, we'd love to have you join us for that. Please sign up in the Church Center app uh, or on your way out of the service today. This service is going to be fun. The service is going to be fun, all right, all right, so, so you're, you're, allowed, you're allowed to have some fun with us today. In my life, I have spent an unusual amount of time, for most people, in graveyards. As a child, I would accompany my father to multiple funerals, he was a pastor also, and graveside ceremonies. And every holiday with family would eventually seem to hold the traditional drive to the cemetery to visit the graveside of some loved ones that had passed. And today, in my role as pastor, I'm in a lot of graveyards as well. And the same thing happens every single time that I go into a graveyard. The same thing. Everything is just like it was before I got there. And then when I leave the graveyard, the same thing happens. Everything is still the same. It's just normal. But it turns out that I know somebody who has a track record of going into graveyards and messing everything up. You're like, who is it? We need to go get him. (laughs) It's Jesus. And today we're going to talk about three graveyards of Jesus. The first one is the graveyard of the demoniac. Each night... Throw yourself back 2,000 years, and each night Jesus would go to sleep in his town where he was living called Capernaum. And where he would sleep, he was right on the edge of the water, right on the edge of the lake. They call it the Sea of Galilee in the Bible, but it's really just a lake. It's the lowest freshwater lake in the world. And it's surrounded on all sides by rapidly elevating hills and cliffs that create this sound effect, this amphitheater effect. And during quiet moments, you can hear things literally from the other side of the lake. And the scripture tells us that there was a man on one side of the lake, the opposite side of the lake from where Jesus was. Mark chapter 5, verse 3. It says, this man lived in the burial caves, the graveyard, and could no longer be restrained, even with the chain of Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. Each night when Jesus was trying to sleep, thank you, I believe that he could hear. Jesus would try to sleep and he could hear the howling of this demoniac, this man in the graveyard that was howling in an agony. And Jesus could either hear it in his ears or he could hear it in his spirit. That there was a man in trouble that the devil had gotten a hold of. And this man was just like any other person we might meet today. 
except something had happened in his life. Maybe he had been married and had a family, but things didn't work out. Maybe he could have been abused as a child, and now the demons of his past have come back and tormented his soul. Maybe he's been informed of the fact that he has a terminal disease and he just went to a very dark place. Or maybe he started experimenting with a little weed, a little wine, and a little meth to hide the pain. And pa-bam! Just like that, his life is out of control. And bit by bit, he's opened himself up to spiritual forces that he was not fully aware of, and the demonic comes in. And in fact, the Scripture tells us that he had thousands of demons. Whatever his trauma was, life has simply become too much to deal with for this man. And Jesus was on the other side of the lake, and he just couldn't let it go. So after a long day of teaching and ministry, Jesus gets into a boat on purpose, and he makes his way to the other side of the lake. It's nighttime. And the devil knows something's different. Something's up. Why is Jesus going to the other side of the lake? This is the wrong side of the lake for Jesus. It's a place where Satan was in charge. So Satan tries to kill Jesus before Jesus can make his one, one and a half hour sail over to the other side. And so... Satan does something very interesting. He sends a giant and rapidly forming storm to try to kill Jesus while he's in the boat. This storm is so ferocious, it terrifies his disciples. His disciples, his followers, the, the, the guys, they are, they are sailing the boat across this lake. And as soon as Jesus got in, he was exhausted. Plus, he had some work to do on the other side, so he took a nap. Mark 4.39, when Jesus woke up in the middle of the storm, it's raging around. Jesus is just sleeping. He rebuked the wind. Somebody say rebuked. <laughs> he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. That's how I feel with cell phones that go off in church on Sundays. <laughs> the, uh, so, the, uh, is my cell phone off? I should, hey, make sure your cell phone's off now, okay? Um, so somebody say Silence. Silence. So rebuked in silence. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was great calm. The words rebuked and silenced are really important. Jesus was talking to the storm like it was alive. Because Jesus understood that the storm was satanic in nature. So he rebuked it. He spoke to the demon storm with a ferocity that communicates, your days are numbered. Jesus is kicking devil butts and he's just getting started. Amen. That's, what's, that, that's the tone. You need to understand the tone. To Satan, he is saying, I'm coming for you and I'm going to destroy all your works. Amen. So Jesus is on the way to the graveyard to change a life. And it won't be the last time. So they finally get to the other side of the lake. And this poor, tormented man in the graveyard rushes to meet Jesus. Mark 5, 7, with a shriek, he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. Then Jesus demanded, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion. This is the demons talking now. Because there are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirit begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man, entered the pigs, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. What an interesting turn in that story. This created quite a stir in the community. A lot of people didn't like Jesus for this. And honestly, if Jesus steals all your bacon, you might have some issues with Jesus. <laughs> I 
Don't touch my bacon. <laughs> Verse 18, Jesus is taking off now. The man has been totally set free. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, no, go home to your family. I, I got to love this part. He had a family. Imagine. Imagine what that family had been going through for years. Tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things that Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. Now notice this. Notice how the grace of God shows up in the graveyard of this man's life. And Jesus did not say to the man, you are such a fool. Why did you let this happen? That's not what Jesus did. There was no shame with Jesus. He simply delivered him and set him free. Why? Because Jesus loved him. And in case you have forgotten this or never heard it, in case you need to be told for the first time or last time, Jesus loves you. He loves you today. He's always loved you. And He is trying in graveyard moments of your life to rescue you, to restore you, and to redeem you. And you might feel today like this man in the story howling in the graveyard. You might feel and connect with that worthless feeling or bound up or betrayed or confused. But the resurrected Jesus that we celebrate today is here. And if you will let him, he wants to change everything in your life. The author in Mark is painting a profoundly pitiful picture of this devil-controlled life. This man had often been bound with fetters and chains, but he broke them. And no man, no human agency could tame him. They called the authorities to deal with him, but they could not stop him or help him. The social service programs couldn't do it. The rehabs couldn't help him. The criminal justice system with its first-time intervention program was of no use because this man's problem was of a demonic source. And let me help you with this today. When you've got a bunch of demons all up inside of your head or under your bed, don't make friends with them. You'll quickly learn that you cannot solve supernatural issues with natural approaches. It simply takes inviting Jesus into the graveyard area of your life and inviting Him to set you free. Because Jesus is stronger than the storms that rage around you. Jesus is stronger than the chains that bind you. Jesus is stronger than any addiction that has you as its slave. And Jesus is stronger than all the situations that you've gotten entangled up in. And today, Jesus is still walking into graveyards and setting captives free. Amen. And if you want Jesus to walk into the graveyard in your life, run to Jesus and he'll set you free. Now, a couple years go by. A couple years go by, and Jesus walks into another graveyard 90 miles away. This time, a close friend of Jesus named Lazarus had died. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. That means he's definitely dead. When Jesus saw Mary, the sister of Lazarus, weeping, and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger, somebody say anger. anger, deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. That's fascinating. He, you don't often think of this side of Jesus. Jesus was deeply grieved and weeping the loss of his close friend. But before that, he was angry. 
angry. We can understand how anger emerges in these moments from the sorrow and weight of grief that he is feeling, that his friends are feeling. But you have to ask the question, who is Jesus angry at? Is he angry at the people for grieving? Is he angry at their lack of faith? No, that's not what's going on. Jesus is angry at the one who brought death into the world. Death, you see, was never to be part of the plan for mankind. But sin, at the deception of Satan, brought it into the human situation. Jesus is angry at the devil. And you can almost feel the resolve building in the heart of Jesus. If this were a movie, this is where the, the music would change. All right? And it would get really, really intense and aggressive. And if you could peek into the mind of Jesus at this moment, you could, you could see the, just going in his mind. It would be like, this means war. Let's blow this thing wide open. Let's go. Verse 38, Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. A cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. There's always one in the crowd. The smell will be awful. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. <clears throat> this, it's a great moment. This is my favorite story in the Bible. So is the other story. <clears throat> here, you got, here you got Lazarus. Let's picture it. Walking out of the graveyard. And the friends and family of Lazarus, like, they're out unwrapping their stinky and formerly dead friend. I love this part. Jesus accomplishes so much in this moment. Satan is now on notice that the end has come for him. His rule and dominion are no longer going to go unchallenged. And stinky people everywhere are welcome to follow Jesus. <clears throat> You can put that on the YouTube thumbnail, Jesse, right there. <laughs> no matter how much Satan has ravaged and destroyed a life, a marriage, a friendship, a future, if the devil has completely destroyed a person's life, even if they stink like death or sin or poverty or illness or brokenness, Jesus welcomes all the stinky and wants to bring them all back to life. And today, he wants to resurrect your hopes and dreams. And he wants to empower you to be more than you could have ever imagined. In the graveyard moments of your life, when all hope has been lost, when the stink of sin and despair and disappointment consume you, invite Jesus into those graveyard moments of your life because Jesus still brings dead things back to life. Jesus is stronger than the chains that bind. Jesus is stronger than the stinketh that stains. So bring your stinky selves to Jesus this Easter Sunday. You're like, I don't smell. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. Now, a few days later, after this moment, a few days later, Jesus shows up at another graveyard. Two down, one to go. Once again, Jesus can hear the howling of a sin-soaked world. Past, present, and future. You can hear the howling of those who are experiencing the scourges of Satan as a result of his illegitimate rulership of the world. And once again, Jesus heads out on a rescue mission to another graveyard. This time... He comes down Palm Sunday Road to the cheers and accolades of tens of thousands of people. And just a few days later, he willingly surrenders himself to the Roman authorities. Jesus is falsely accused. This perfect and sinless Jesus. The crowds, they call for his execution. 
the authorities, they mock him. They place a crown of thorns upon his head to humiliate him and to torture him. They whip him multiple times with a metal-tipped whip. Over and over and over and over again, they would whip him and bruise him and rip the flesh off his back. And they make Jesus carry the wooden cross through the crowds that he will ultimately be executed on. And they will nail his hands and his feet to that cross and watch him slowly and painfully bleed to death. There we have Jesus hanging on a cross. All our hopes and dreams now dead. They bring his body down from the cross and they prepare his body to be laid in a tomb, a burial cave. Now, it's not obvious from the story, but what you don't automatically understand is that Jesus was crucified in a graveyard. That's amazing for this sermon because Jesus has a track record of doing some crazy things in graveyards. Just like when Jesus went to the graveyard to rescue the howling demoniac, just like when Jesus went to the graveyard to raise up Lazarus from the grave, Jesus now goes to the graveyard to rescue you and me. See, Friday night was dark, Saturday night even darker, but Sunday was different. Mark 16, Saturday evening when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, mother the, Mary the mother of James and Salmon, went to, and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. When they entered the tomb, there was a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. What, what just happened? Our hero Jesus, who was unjustly executed, is now no longer dead. And for Jesus, this was just another graveyard miracle. As the worship team comes up, Jesus has turned this ultimate graveyard into a garden of resurrection. A garden where hopes and dreams can be reborn. A garden where you and I can be restored. A garden where you can be forgiven. A garden where you can be set free. Spiritually, Jesus was the sacrifice for our sins. But that's not all. This was part of an even bigger spiritual conflict. The battle to overcome the kingdom of darkness and to allow the kingdom of God to end. Jesus was crucified, descended to hell, defeated Satan, and destroyed the power of death. And he rose from the dead. That, my friends, is why Easter is such a big deal. Easter means not only can you be forgiven, but you could come alive. Truly alive, even if it's for the very first time. Because Jesus is stronger than the chains that bind you. And Jesus is stronger than the stinketh that stains you. And Jesus is still, today, stronger than death. And he gives us all the opportunity to have a bright hope for tomorrow. Why don't you stand with me as we close today? Across the room, let's just take a moment to respond. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads? I wonder which of these graveyard moments you connect with most today. You connect with the man who's tormented in the graveyard. 
Do you feel like his story is a description of parts of your life? If that's the case today, then just like the demoniac, you need Jesus. And you need Jesus to set you free. And Jesus can and will. Maybe you can relate to the people around the tomb of Lazarus. Maybe life has slipped into a place of despair or your dreams and hopes have died. That's where you connect today. Maybe you need to ask Jesus to raise you back to life. Give you a clean slate and start over. Or maybe you found yourself in a place where you need to set aside those foolish things and falsehoods and that you need to simply embrace the forgiveness and leadership of Jesus. Forgiveness of your sins, leadership of Jesus in your life, where you just surrender it all and let Jesus give you a brand new life. As the worship team leads us, however you connect today, let's spend some time in our own words praying and inviting Jesus into the graveyard moments of our life. He can set us free. The altars up here are open. Maybe some of you need to come out and spend some time in prayer today. Just giving it all to Jesus right now. Let's go.